You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Happy New Year, Will. Happy New Year, David. And hello, listeners. A Happy New Year to you, too. Yes. Welcome to episode 77 of the Common Descent Podcast. We are wrapping up 2019 with a discussion of the transition from fish to tetrapods. A good topic for our last main episode of the year. Arguably the most important evolutionary innovation in the history of vertebrates. Says the tetrapod. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't think of anything that could have been more important. The So tetrapods are all of the vertebrates that aren't fish. Yes. All the vertebrates that are ancestrally land dwellers, starting with early amphibians, giving rise to reptiles and mammals, all of our favorite things, including ourselves. The evolutionary transition thus involves the transition over from animals, vertebrate animals that are adapted to living in the water, to animals that are adapted to living on land. Yes. We've talked about the opposite transition with whales in episode 41, where they went from land to water. This time we're talking about the original vertebrate to land, fish to land transition. So we'll talk about what the differences are, what makes a tetrapod, and we'll t- uh, mention a bunch of the famous examples that tell us a bit of what we know about this transition. This episode topic was requested a bunch of times. Cool. So specifically the transition was requested by two of our patrons, Nils and Jake, plus Austin and Rip Rattle, and early tetrapods as a subject has been requested by Dylan, Jake, not the same Jake, different Jake, (laughs) and Rita. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to talk about a bunch of these things just for all those requesters and uh, everybody else who's listening. (laughs) And all you tetrapods out there. Speaking of our audience, uh, patrons. We have those. All year, this podcast has been supported by our patrons. The donations we get allow us to keep the podcast hosted. This year, they let us go to NAPC and Dragon Con and do all sorts of cool stuff. And we've got cool ideas for what we might do in 2020. And of course, if you're a patron at a certain level, we will thank you by name on the podcast. So here to wrap up the year... Big thanks to Vicky, Mason, and Dean. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Remember that if you are a patron, you get goodies like bonus stuff, of which we have plans yes. for the future. So consider it. A couple other things in terms of announcements. I think the only other major thing is that a couple days after this episode comes out, we will release our end of the year Q&A for the end of 2019. We recorded it already. It's in the editing process. It is very long. <laughs> well, so we might introduce transition breaks in it. <laughs> and it was so much fun. Oh, it was a good one. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. It, we had a great old time. And we hope you have a great time listening. But that's it for announcements, which means that before we move on to our main topic, we are going to, for the last time this decade... Talk about the news. News. As has been our tradition for three years almost. Jeez. Every episode we pick some news that catches our eye related to the subjects of the podcast, fossil record evolution, and so on, and share them with you. Keeps everybody updated with what's going on in the world. Including us. Will, what news have you chosen? What news is worthy of the end of 2019? Penguins. Oh, you know what? I'm on board. <laughs> take us take us on a journey. My God. <laughs> You're right. Forget my news. There's penguins the whole time. A uh, bit of news about a new species of Paleocene penguin. Cool. Uh, good alliteration there as well, I think. <laughs> uh, this is research by Jacob Blokeland et al. in Paleontologia Electronica. And the article is from Sci News. And so this is a new species uh, fossil penguin found in uh, New Zealand on the Chatham Islands. 
I would believe they might be called. Chatham. Chatham. I don't know. Yeah. Located. We uh, have at least one listener from New Zealand. <laughs> I know. So let us know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who either nodded or just slammed a hand on the table. <laughs> All right. Who's very angry with us. <laughs> this is about just over 500 miles off the coast of mainland New Zealand. And this penguin is from 60 to 62 million years old. Okay. So very early Cenozoic. Yes. Right after the KPG. So this is Kupopo Stilwelli, and it is notable. First, it's a fossil penguin. Cool. Awesome. But it's notable for being the earliest penguin to have modern proportions. Oh. By that, I mean a body shape, a body proportioned very similar to today's penguins. Because penguins are weird. Yes. Very, very weird when compared to other birds. Some of these proportions are mainly having to do with the the feet. It has very short legs, which is a penguin thing, and means when walking on land, it would have waddled like penguins. Cool. And so this is a very old, the first penguin-looking penguin, which is important for a few things about penguin evolution. It's also fairly normal-sized. Uh, it's not as big as the the giant penguins that are also found in that general area, one of which we mentioned in a previous news, I think earlier this year. Yeah, sure did. This one is just just over a meter, so like three and a half feet, just about king penguin sized. Okay, so not, not preposterous. Yeah, not emperor, so it's not as big as our biggest, but it's as big as the second biggest, if I have my penguins correct right. in my head. It's not a preposterous penguin, but it's a perfectly probable penguin. Absolutely. How did you know the title of the paper? <laughs> <laughs> In this area during this time, there would have been no ice caps on the si- on the South Pole. So we wouldn't have had quite as cold a s- southern oceans in that area as we do today. So probably subtropical, uh, almost tropical New Zealand. And this is where potentially penguins may have first started to evolve according to this fossil. Or at least that's one of the things potentially suggested. Because this penguin goes so far back in the the penguin fossil record it's very likely this area may be at least close to the origin site of the first penguins uh the on south island another nearby new zealand island is another place where other early penguin fossils have been found so this area is not not unknown to the the beginnings of this group what this says about penguin evolution is that it was very likely rapid the ancestors of penguins probably diverged from the the other bird lineages in the late cretaceous and then diversified into various penguin species with this being so close to the end of the cretaceous and looking like a penguin suggests that they evolved rapidly then to penguin body forms which wouldn't be surprising that that's a trend we've seen in the fossil record before where you have something real different and real specialized is under strong selection and then Mm -hmm. it kind of stabilizes in its new normal. Yeah, so it looks like they achieved penguin body shape early and quickly after diverging, which is cool. Penguins have been penguins for quite some time. That is a very interesting thing to know about. Like like, that if that's true, and even if it's not, you know, evidenced by this fossil, Penguins have been penguins for pretty much the whole Cenozoic. Yes. Petition to rename the Cenozoic the Age of Penguins. Seconded. Okay. Hey, Absolutely. Oh yeah, we'll start. We'll get on the internet. <laughs> we'll start a petition. <laughs> we'll call it the Penguinocene. <laughs> well, while we're talking about aquatic things, not that you mentioned aquatic stuff in there, but penguins are aquatic. Yeah. Partially. <laughs> I brought some news about whales. Cool. Yes. Specifically, a new whale... That provides insights into how whale locomotion evolved. Cool. This is research by Philip Gingrich et al. in PLOS One. Here's a little fun sort of science, modern science history fact. Phil Gingrich, super famous whale guy. I remember uh, my advisor, Russ Graham, once told me that he knew, I believe he, he he knows Phil, I think they go way back, that... Phil wanted to study primates and then accidentally came upon an ancient whale and became the whale expert. 
Which is I, not an unusual story yeah. <laughs> in paleontology. I feel you on that. I never expected to be the, the oceans topic person. Yep. <laughs> and we'll link to an article in The Guardian by Nicola Davis. So, if you've listened to episode 41 on whale evolution, this part will be familiar to you. Whales uh, are descended from land-dwelling ancestors. The earliest whales in the fossil record go back to the Eocene, known from several continents, a group known as the Protocetids. These are the earliest aquatic whale ancestors, after they moved off the land. Protocetids include all sorts of cool aquatic and semi-aquatic whales. They're different from whales in many ways, one of the main ones being that while modern whales are fully aquatic tail swimmers, mm -hmm. most protocetids are thought to have been semi-aquatic foot swimmers. Much more like otters. Right, they're propelling themselves with their limbs, whereas whales today have lost their hind limbs and their tail is where they're getting most of their yeah. movement from. Specialized into a big paddle. Like most fish and sharks and things. Like, yeah, no, the tail is where the power comes from. This research describes a new species called Aegisetus gehenne from Egypt, from an area called, uh, a site called Wadi al-Hitan, with apologies in case that's not right, <laughs> which the article points out means Valley of Wales. Cool valley. Yeah, that's, that's the valley I want to be in. Aegisetus is from the very latest Eocene epoch, around 35 million years ago, making it the youngest known member of the Protocetids. And with two specimens found, one partial and one nearly complete, it's also one of the best preserved early whales. It is around three and a half meters long, which is like 12 feet or so, so decent sized, dolphin sized. And it has a handful of interesting features in comparison to other whales. For example, compared to other earlier protocetids, its hind limbs are slightly smaller. And notably, its hind limbs are smaller than its front limbs. There you go. Which is a little bit closer to the condition we see in modern whales. <laughs> Things are leaning the right way. Also, its hind limbs and pelvis don't appear to be directly connected to the vertebrae. Which suggests, which suggests that it might have been using its hind limbs less for swimming. They were becoming less important. On the other hand, its body and tail are notably elongated. It has a longer torso and a longer tail, and as the authors describe, a more flexible body. Which seems to suggest not only that it was more aquatic, because if you don't have, you know, if you're losing the size of your limbs, you're going to lose terrestrial options, less foot-powered, and maybe it was swimming with an undulatory motion. Nice. So not swimming with the tail, but with the body. Sort of if you imagine how a croc swims, or how an eel swims, the whole body is moving. Of course, this would be up and down instead of side to side. The authors point out that there are other early whales like Basilosaurus, the famous, the closest mammals have ever gotten to a sea serpent, <laughs> Basilosaurus, also had this sort of long body with smaller limbs. And the authors are suggesting this looks like there may have been a, a, a time where certain members of the early whale lineages were dwindling the importance of their hind limbs and they had this long undulating body which might have served as an in-between as they were losing foot power and on the way to modern day tail powered swimmers well and that makes sense because one of the things that seems to be a counterintuitive hurdle from going to foot swimming to tail swimming is those don't necessarily seem like they'd work together, so transitioning might seem difficult. But this makes sense, at least to me, that if you're kicking with your limbs, starting to move the body along with those kicks would help. And then all it takes is for you to stop kicking <laughs> and then start forcing, focusing more of that energy into 
the tail while it undulates. And then there's your transition. It's it's a cool because it it's so easy to imagine that you started this way, you ended this way, and it just went straight from one to the other. But here is the suggestion that there could have been a whole intermediate time period where they were swimming a whole other way. Yeah, there's a whole period of wiggly whales that are unlike today. Wiggly whales. <laughs> we are on top of alliteration today. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll rely on you to find an alliterative term for this next one. Can do. This is about lice-like insects on what appear to be dinosaur feathers. Ooh. I mean, they could only be dinosaur feathers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is interesting because of how old the feathers and the lice-like things are. Ooh. So this is research by Taiping Gao et al. in Nature Communications. And the article we'll be linking to is Brian Handwork in Smithsonian Mag. These are very small insects clinging to still some feathers preserved in amber. Amber again. Yep. Which is 62. Yeah. Amber is where you you typically find these crazy, awesome, detailed little finds. Yeah. I think we, we did talk about a while back a tick yes. on dinosaur feathers in amber. This is from the mid-Cretaceous about a hundred million years ago from Myanmar and is the this date is particularly notable because before this the earliest bird louse previously known in the fossil record was from Germany and was 44 million years old. Okay. <laughs> so a little bit of an extension. Yeah. Now by the 44 million years ago those were pretty much modern looking lice which tells us they've been fairly consistent since then but the early periods of lice lice evolution were not well known, and this may give us some information into that. These were not fully formed. They're nymphs, so young insects. Okay. And ten of them were found preserved on a pair of feathers. Each was less than 0.2 millimeters long. Wow. Itty bitty. They have been named Mesotherus angeli, and they resemble modern lice in some ways. Uh, they have wingless bodies. Large chewing mandibles, which is what makes them so irritating as parasites today. But slightly different antennae, slightly different leg claws. Okay. So not quite lice. Not sure yet whether this belongs to the same order as lice or not. So they're, they're still trying to determine exactly how close this is to true lice. But it's very lice-like, and it seems to be functioning in a similar lifestyle way. The feathers show some signs of what these lice-esque, these lice-adjacent insects might have been doing. <laughs> uh, one of them shows signs of gnawing damage, which suggests that they have established feather-feeding lifestyles by this time. Which is a, a notable thing that it shows up so early. And that this could suggest... Uh, further suggests, I should say, that they evolved to exploit the expansion of feathered dinosaurs and early birds. That's cool. So if they had already evolved to gnaw on the feathers, the feathers could have been part of what boosted them. An interesting insight into how these uh, uh, parasites might have gotten started, or not started necessarily, but spread or exploited things early on. Initially, they thought they were early bird feathers, but... Uh, one of the co-authors on the paper who specializes in feathers believes that one, at least, is a non-avian dinosaur. Okay. And is consistent with uh, the feathers on the tail fragment from the Burmese am amber. Oh, cool. So it seems like this is one was non-avian. The other is more similar to uh, uh, feathers found alongside of primitive tooth birds in the same deposit. So it looks like we have non-avian and early primitive bird, which is a strong case that these insects were generalists. They were not on a specific group or species. Right, right. If you were feathered, we we're chewing on you, which is notable that they weren't a niche animal. They were just parasitic across the board. Now, of all the samples of amber from this site, only this one with the two feathers had any of these lice-like organisms in it. Uh, so they were not common among the, the uh, other pieces of amber. They don't think this rarity is because the lice were rare. They think it's probably preservation bias, that they weren't 
preserving because they're so small and delicate. That makes sense. Uh, and the researchers heavily suspect that they were probably very common since we're seeing them across the different feathers. Right. And, and things like that are pretty common today. Indeed. And so really the next steps for this research is to hope to find adults to get a better idea of what early lice evolution might have looked like and to really fill in what lice-like things have been doing for the last hundred million years. Very interesting. Puny parasites feeding on feathers reveal to researchers the early evolution of lice-like lice -like insects living in integument. <laughs> I really like the notion that the lice, that the, these creatures may have diversified along with feathers mm -hmm. because I, I have read uh, uh, studies in the past that point out that human lice are very closely tied to human evolution. Yeah. And that the difference between body lice and... I, I remember reading a study at one point that was attempting to link the origin of body lice to the invention of clothing. Oh, finally giving them a place to hide on. Like, And it seems that there's at least reason to think that our lice, which are very specific to humans, may be tied into certain stages in human history. So it makes perfect sense to imagine parasites going... There's a whole new type of integument now, and now we have a whole new niche to exploit. From a parasite point of view, when your giant walking biomes are changing, it makes sense that that would heavily affect your evolutionary path. Right. If, if you were living on a barren rock, <laughs> and suddenly a forest appeared, and now there's all sorts of new places to live. I mean, one can only assume that if the place you're living on is going through drastic changes, you would adapt to hopefully make those changes, take take those changes into account. One would imagine. Yes. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Hey, speaking of bugs, I've got news about bugs, <gasps> particularly bugs, arthropods back in the Cambrian. So we're going way back that appear to have left behind evidence of neural tissue wow brains and the nervous system maybe this is research by javier ortega hernandez et al in proceedings of the royal society b and we'll link to an article in live science by nicolette lenice lenes lenice nicolette l believe it or not this is not the first time neurological tissues nerve tissue has been spotted in cambrian fossils so because this is Cambrian, right? At almost as old as animal fossils get, the idea of having nervous tissue preserved it has huge implications for the evolution of animals as we know them. And indeed, other studies that have claimed to find ner nerve tissue have attempted to use them for studies of anatomy and relationships in early arthropods, that is to say, things like insects and crustaceans that have an exoskeleton. But, as you can imagine, this has been a bit controversial. Anytime you're finding soft tissue in the fossil records, someone's going to come forth and try to point out where it could be wrong, because there's a lot of ways it could be wrong. <laughs> Extraordinary claims. Indeed, indeed. And so, yeah, most of the time these nervous tissue set specimens are a single specimen, or it's incomplete, and that makes it very difficult to ensure validity. Here, these researchers claim to have... Better support. Further evidence. This is a species, a, a, a U arthropod, so arthropod related to the arthropods we have today, which is called in the, the, the article a short great appendage U arthropod. I don't know what that means, but it sounds cool. Scientifically, Alalcomeneus is its name. Not the first time it's been identified, nor the first time it's been identified with nerve tissue. A specimen in South China was identified that appears to have had... It was claimed that it had nerve tissue. Here, they have identified two more that also seem to preserve soft tissue remnants of the nervous system. Wow, show-offs. These are from not the Burgess Shale, but what are called Burgess Shale-type deposits. Because that's how famous the Burgess Shale is. <laughs> That makes me feel a little bad for those deposits. <laughs> right? If only we were described first. <laughs> oh, you're Burgess Shale. Like, I have a name. <laughs> <laughs> the Burgess Shale, as we've discussed before, way back in episode nine, we talked about it, 
is a super famous North American fossil site that has just extraordinary preservation of Cambrian fossils. These are similar extraordinary deposits in Utah going back about 500 million years ago. Cambrian. The evidence of a central nervous system is seen as what is described as a dark carbonaceous compression throughout the body, kind of like a stain. Or if you ever if you've ever seen like a leaf preserved and it's basically just a carbon shadow in the shape of a leaf, that's pretty much what they're seeing here. And this carbonaceous compression seems to show a dorsal brain up in the head with little connections to the four eyes of the animal, and then a cord that goes down through the rest of the body and puts off threads to the various sections. And in fact, you can't see it, listeners, here, but it'll be in the blog post. I'm showing Will huh. the images. Neat. Yeah, so it looks like it's just sort of this double line that goes from the head down the rest of the body and has branches coming off of it that they are interpreting as nerve tissue. It doesn't not look like that. Yeah. <laughs> and because they found it on two new specimens and it looks like the original one, they're suggesting, all right, three is a much bigger sample size than one. This seems to suggest there may be some validity here. And because all three are found in Burgess Shale type deposits, it might mean that there is something unique that is required for the preservation of nerve tissue that you wouldn't get in other places. That's an exciting find because getting an idea of how the nervous system is laid out can really start to tell you about how the body processes information, you know, wh how it's transmitting. You know, it's, it's stuff like this is how you can start to get information of why cockroaches seem so difficult to kill when <laughs> part of their body's damaged because they don't have that centralized brain. They have bundles. So like, Finding these sorts of fossils can really unveil a lot about how this organism was functioning, or at least how it was um, controlling its body and processing the environment around it. So there's a lot of information there. And three? Yeah, how about that? Wow! That is a pretty good batch you got there. So exciting. And I'd be fascinated to find out why. Why the, is the nervous system showing up so if if this is indeed what it is, why is it showing up so picture perfectly? Yeah, and it is pretty cool. Like I said, blog post will yes. link to it. You can look at check it out. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the and the article in Live Science extensively covers this. Not everyone's convinced. As you said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. A lot of people have argued that you can't get nervous tissue. People have looked at claims of other supposed nervous tissue and suggested that it might just be remnants of decayed matter or biofilms, right? Bacteria and such colonizing that area and leaving behind a similar looking stain. Other studies have apparently found that similar looking stains in the head region are actually pretty common in a lot of fossils for whatever reason. And other studies have found that nervous tissue decays so quickly that you wouldn't expect it to be preserved. But of course, this is science. And so other people will say, right, but most of those are asymmetrical stains. These are symmetrical, which is what leads people to suggest they might be an actual authentic part of the body. So we're still going back and forth. In general, the one thing that pretty much everyone agrees upon, including me, is that they'd like to see more. Yeah. Find more examples, get us a better sample size, a better sense of what the trends are. I'm hoping it'd be real cool if this is what it is. This is a really perfect example of the extraordinary claims and extraordinary evidence. And because that phrase does not mean you should be harsh on new ideas. It means that if you come up with something new that we've never found nor expected to find, every example so far says you're probably wrong. But if your specimen's a really good example of it, that doesn't mean you're definitely right, but it may it may uh, merit further investigation. And that's kind of what these responders are saying is, yes, but we've seen a lot of stuff like this. Maybe not identical, but like this. 
And all of those appear to not be that. Every single one seems to not be the thing you're saying this is. And then other people are saying, yes, but they're like this, not actually matching this. Yeah. And that's, where's that line? Trying to zero in on where is our actual evidence. Yes. And I always kind of find these moments really exciting. Because it's just, it's it's a little bit up in the air right now. And really, we don't know where it's going to fall down. Yeah. So we just have to wait until more comes out. So stay tuned. Yes. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll cover the next uh, paper that supports or rejects this idea. We can only hope. But that's the news. That's the news. Which means it is time for the main discussion. After this short break, we will discuss tetrapods and how they came to be. Will, yes. what's a tetrapod? Tetrapods, in the name, give you the definition, which is one of those nice words. Mm -hmm. Tetra being four, and pod being foot, four-footed. It is, by or the origin of the term, the four-legged creatures. Yes, yeah, specifically, the four-legged vertebrates. Mm -hmm. Limbed vertebrates, which includes today all of your ancestrally terrestrial Animals with bones. Amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and all of their delightful descendants. Which is also why, because we identify things based on ancestry, the four-foot thing mostly works. Yes. Snakes are tetrapods. Whales are tetrapods. Because if you're ancestrally in a group, you're always in the group. So yeah, tetrapods are vertebrates on land. It includes us. It includes all of our limited friends. But the ancestors of tetrapods were fish. Vertebrates today are tetrapods and fish. But the first vertebrates were fish. Which means that at some point, a group of fish gave rise to the ancestors of all of our other tetrapody vertebrates. So leggy things. Which means that before we can get into talking about tetrapods, we have to talk a little bit about fish. So, if you look at fish, there are two Basic, very broad types of fish. Fish with jaws and fish without jaws. Yep. Jawless fish are your hagfish and lampreys and such. They used to be the common ones in the early days. Now we just got those two. Jawed fish are all your other fish. Jawed fish come in two very broad categories. Cartilaginous, which are your sharks and rays and skates and chimeras. Yep. And bony fish, which are fish that have a bony skeleton. What you typically are thinking of when you think of fish. Bony fish come in a variety, but mainly there are two categories. Yeah, there are. Ray-finned fish, the Actinopterygii, are most fish. Yes, once again, what if I ask you to just pick a picture of fish? Those. Ray-finned fish are named for their ray fins, which means if you look at the fin of a goldfish or a tuna or something like that, the fins that they're using to swim around are supported by bony rods, these rays, yeah, these it's, thin rays that structurally sit inside them. It's mostly, usually transparent, but it's mostly that thin webbing with thin kind of whisker-like things, the rays holding it up and moving it. The other group of bony fish are the lobe-finned fish, Sarcopterygians. As their name suggests, Lobe-finned fish are differentiated from ray-finned fish by the structure of their fins. Lobe-finned fish have fins that are attached, I love, I, I read this in a couple places, by a fleshy stalk <laughs> to the body. And what they mean by that is that it's covered in skin, it's full of muscle, it is a muscular, beefier fin. It looks kind of like a digit, like a, a little... It's a limb. Yeah, it's a limb. It's a little limb. And indeed, one of the most famous things about these fleshy stalks is that each one in the front and back has a single bone that attaches to the rest of the body and supports the fin. That bone is homologous, evolutionarily comparable, to the first bone in each of your limbs, the humerus in your arms, and the femur in your legs. But that's it. After that, it's usually more rays. Yeah, exactly. Like, picture if you had your hand, but just one little lump 
and then a very thin rayed fin around the edge of it. Yes. Except that your hand is just the bone coming out of your shoulder. One bone and then a bunch of rays. Ray finned fish are almost all the fish in the ocean today. There are about 25,000 species of ray finned fish in the ocean, Mm -hmm. whereas there are about eight species of lobe finned fish in the ocean. Asterisk. (laughs) Give me a second. There are three general groups within lobe finned fish today. Coelacanths, woo, which are very cool. Oh, they're so awesome. They are these sort of craggy-looking fish that live deep down in off the coast of Africa, I believe. And they have the really just perfectly picturesque examples of lobe fins. The other group is the lungfish. Still very cool. Which have the fleshy fins. Also, as their name implies, famously have lungs in addition to gills. So they can breathe... Multiple ways. They do that cool thing where they can just survive in dried riverbeds because <laughs> they don't need that stupid water. Yeah, just, <laughs> air gulping. There are, if I remember the numbers I've read correctly, about two species of coelacanth and about six species of lungfish. That sounds, yeah. The third group of sarcopterygians, lobe fin fish, are the tetrapods, which is why I say asterisk. Yes. Because technically... <laughs> There are also whales and uh, walruses and stuff living in the ocean. (laughs) Technically sarcopterygians. But as we've discussed before, fish is not really a taxonomic term. So while taxonomic, right, right, cladistically, evolutionarily, all tetrapods are a branch off of sarcopterygia, which means that we are all sarcopterygia, while the common name for sarcopterygia is lobe-finned fish, it's very strange to call tetrapods lobe-finned fish. Because we're not really lobe-finned. And we're not really fish. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that's our ex- that's our fishy family tree. Coelacanths, lungfish, tetrapods. And at this point, I should point out that for the sake of all the fish fans out there, I believe there are, even if you count tetrapods, there are more species of ray-finned fish than lobe-finned fish in the world today we are yet the minority it's once again the example i always like to use is that if aliens were ranking earth (laughs) they could very well go this planet is awesome for insects and fish yeah no fish are doing great it's so mark that down as the insect fish planet (laughs) (laughs) until they get out the microscope yes (laughs) now the transition that takes us from lobe fin fish, which are our closest ancestor uh, and relatives, to true tetrapods occurs in the late Devonian. This is where we see this shift from water to land. And before we get into some of the details, I want to just give a general overview. I'm taking a page out of Will's book from Horse Evolution, 76, to talk about what are some of the changes that had to happen and what are some of the things to keep an eye out as we're going through this transition. Yeah, what does a fish need? Obviously, one is that you need to go from breathing in water to breathing in air, which, again, already handled. Lungfish have lungs. And that's that's also not an uncommon thing among fish in general. Like, no. the list of fish that can gulp air is actually wide. Yes. It's a long list. That's not to say that they're perfectly primed to breathe in air, but the foundations are already in fish that can breathe air without having to use water as a medium. The other super obvious thing, and it's going to be in the title, is that you have to get those fins for swimming transitioned into legs for walking. This requires a change of not only how the legs themselves are constructed, but how the girdles, the pectoral girdle, which is the shoulder, and the pelvic girdle, which are the hips, how that interacts with the body. You need a whole bunch of different musculature. You need more bone structure. Another thing that, speaking of the shoulder girdle, in fish, the shoulder girdle that attaches to their pectoral fins tends to be attached to the head. Yeah. Fish don't have necks. This is something that changes over the course of this transition because you need your shoulders to not be on your face. That's why it's impossible to strangle a fish. You can't strangle a no. fish. That's why they're so successful. <laughs> strangle proof. <laughs> Vertebrates on land, tetrapods tend to have more uh, uh, reinforced vertebrae. Vertebrae interlock more tightly. 
The ribs tend to be bigger and stronger for supporting the body. And then there are other things that are you'll see, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that are harder to know from the fossil record, like senses. Yeah. Seeing in the air is different from seeing on land. Yeah, we mentioned that in, in eyes. Yes, we did. The eye that works underwater does not work well on land and vice versa. Like, yes. you have to make a very special eye that does both. And so you, you have to change it. Episode 68. Also true for hearing, for smell, and some of the stuff that fish use doesn't work in the on in air. Like, as we've mentioned before, the lateral line system. Mm-hmm which is this series of sensory organs that fish have to sense changes in the water around them. Doesn't work in the air. Yeah, it's air's not dense enough. Like, that's that's a lot of the changes that they're going through are just physics. You went from having a thing that supports almost all of your weight. Yep. You're basically living in space. Very dense space. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can move in three dimensions. You can move in three dimensions. You can just hang there and your weight doesn't affect you. And now you're going to where none of that's true. <laughs> You've lost a direction. All of the gravity's on top of you. <laughs> and there's no there's no thickness. There's no medium. The density's all gone. So, yeah, it's physics has changed. Speaking of which, feeding is also very different in air than in water. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. But suffice it to say... In water, you can suck stuff into your mouth. Yeah. Much harder in air. (laughs) So all it's a whole lifestyle change to go from water to land. And fish don't have the benefit that whales do, right? Where you're working with a body that is already kind of ready to go in the water. Because that's where you started. Yeah. Like some of your stuff, you know, already works. Like bones, you know that bones work. (laughs) Right? Limbs, those limbs are going to be great for the water. That's how they started. No problem. Fish had to do it all for the first time. Well, it's, uh, (laughs) I feel like a great comparison between how difficult these transitions are compared to one another is most land-dwelling animals can swim. Yes. Like, there's a very short list of animals that just can't. They exist, but, like, bats can swim. It's very difficult to find a vertebrate that can't swim. I don't know as many fish... That can walk. <laughs> Most fish can't walk. Most. <laughs> Most. This there, is important. There are exceptions. There are wa- There are actually an abundance of walking fish. But not the same proportion <laughs> as swimming vertebrates. So this might be the most ridiculous transition that vertebrates had to make until they, some of them started flying. <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> it's a total overhaul of the body. I just pictured, like, two <laughs> scenes of... A fish looking at land and a bunch of fish looking at it like it's crazy. And then a bunch of relieved early tetrapods on land and one of them looking up. Yes. (laughs) I I want more. (laughs) So since we're starting with fish, it is not a surprise that we need to go back to the Devonian period, also known affectionately as the Age of Fish. It's one of the catchiest names for a period. It's so good. We've talked about the Devonian before in episode 65, where we talked about how the Devonian came to a tragic end. (laughs) But a brief overview. During the Devonian, we are talking going back centered around 400 million years ago, plus a little before and afterwards. There are two major continents, Euro-America near the equator, which is a bunch of your northern continents, and Gondwana further south, which is a bunch of your southern continents grouped together. Generally warm climate. Compared to today, high sea levels in general, leading to lots of shallow oceans in the tropics. Important for things like reefs. Huge, impressive reefs during the Devonian, full of invertebrates like brachiopods and trilobites and aminoids. On land, there are already arthropods, right? Don't don't ever forget that almost any time we brag about vertebrates doing a thing, Bugs did it first. Yes, that is basically true across the board. I I can't. I don't have an example where it's not. Not really. <laughs> I, not one that I can think of. <laughs> so there are Tools buggy maybe? things. Oh. I, I I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, there are buggy things on land. You know, sea scorpion like things, millipede like things. You know who else also did it first? Plants. Yep. There are early rooted plants, and by the end of the Devonian, we do see the first true forests. 
and the first modern soils. In the ocean, lots of fish. These are the only vertebrates. It is known as the age of fish because there are tons of fish. True sharks and their relatives. The spiny sharks yeah. as well, which are the acanthodians. Bony fish includes placoderms, Woo! which we talked about in episode 29. Sharks yeah. in episode 48, by the way. And lots of ray-finned fish and lobe-finned fish. Sarcopterygians go back to the early Devonian. There are lungfish and coelacanth relatives known throughout the Devonian. Right there at the beginning. So all the fish we know and love already in place, major groups at least. Which brings us to the weird ones. <laughs> By the middle Devonian, within the Sarcopterygian group, we start to see a handful of fish that are a little more like tetrapods. Features that are a little more familiar to the things we see in land-dwelling uh, land vertebrates. And let's go through a few of them. These are the tetrapod-like fish. You can also call them tetrapodomorphs. Oh, I like that. Much like how crocodilomorphs are the things that are crocs, but then also all the stuff that aren't quite crocs. Yeah, they're, they're close to, but they don't fit being in crocs. Right. Dinosaur morphs, dinos, and then all the things that aren't quite dinos, but they're close. These are the tetrapodomorphs. The most famous early known tetrapodomorph is a fish called Eusthenopteron. Eusthenopteron was discovered, named way back in 1881. Wow. Long before we had a good sense of this transition. Discovered in Canada, back, uh, lived around 380 million years ago. So late-ish Devonian. It was about a meter long, three feet long, so a decent-sized fish. Yeah, not small. The famous feature of Eusthenopteron, the reason that it's so famous, the reason people know its name in relation to this, is because inside its lobe fin, not only did it have that one bone that attached the shoulder to the fin, it also had two bones attached to the other end of that. Ooh. Look at your arm. You've got a humerus up top and a radius and ulna attached below it. I sure do. In the leg, you've got your femur and then a tibia and fibula. This is true of all vertebrates on land, except the ones who have lost them. That's a basic tetrapod body plan. And here it is in a fish in the Devonian. This is such a cool, like, it's, we're on the first step, but this is such a cool first step. Because so often when we discuss transitions or evolutionary paths, it's very common that we're talking about reduction of stuff. Reduction yeah. of the number of things. You know, sometimes it's exaggerating a feature, but it's not common that you talk about adding, yes. adding elements. You're not just making it bigger, but I'm actually adding pieces. So in the case of the right, Eusthenopteron compared to other lobe fin fish, a lobe fin fish that you might see today has the one bone attached to the shoulder and then a bunch of other bone stuff going on. It's got the rays. It might have little pebbly bones in there. Eusthenopteron has converted more bone material into these two additional bones. One at the top, then two. And then past that, bony rays. Other bony bits. Just generally supporting the fin. But we have humerus, radius, ulna, femur, tibia, fibula in this fish. It also has some features of the skull and teeth that are similar to early tetrapods. But other than that, it's very fishy. Looks like a fish. If you saw a picture of it, it would look, it'd be a fish. One bone in particular that is often drawn attention to is a structure called the hyomandibula, which is a bone that is in the mouth. It is related to feeding movements and gill movements. This is still very well developed in Eusthenopteron, which suggests that it was breathing and feeding very much like a fish. And I mention that because that's going to come up a couple times here, such as in the next super famous tetrapodomorph, something that is a tetrapod-like fish, called Pandorichthys. Pandorichthys is very similar to Eusthenopteron, roughly the same time period, a little bit bigger, but not a huge amount, found over in Europe whereas Eusthenopteron was in Canada. Pandorichthys is a little more tetrapod-like. It has a flatter skull, a longer snout, and its eyes are a little bigger and a little more moved towards the top of the skull. 
<laughs> we're shifting the size of the eyes, which is important because larger eyes are generally considered better for seeing in the air compared to the water, and moving upwards as though they're doing something a little different. That's something that is probably one of the first things I think most people would notice if shown a series of pictures of tetrapodomorphs, is that the part that starts looking less fish-like, or at least most obviously early on, is the face. Yeah, it like, starts looking more salamandery. Yes, it's like fish have a very characteristic face. Not saying it's consistent at all. It's no. fish. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bajillion of them. But they definitely look notably different from most tetrapods. Yeah. Tetra you, <laughs> you start to see those little features pop up. The tetrapod transition, kind of, not exactly, this is an oversimplification, starts at the nose and works its way back. <laughs> well, that's, you, you come out of the water nose first. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it gets a little more, <laughs> and you move. <laughs> it's, like going, it's like the car wash in Willy Wonka. You just... Right. Mm -hmm. So Pandarichthus has a little bit more of a strange-shaped face. The humerus, the, the, the upper arm bone, and the shoulder girdle, the whole shoulder apparatus, are a bit larger. There's more area for muscle attachment, which suggests there's some more strength being put in there. It's a fish that lifts. And that hyomandibula structure that is important for fish breathing and feeding is a little smaller, perhaps lessened importance in its use. Also, Pandorichthus has lost its dorsal and anal fins. That's just that statement. And it's it's a thing you know has to happen, because we don't yep. have those. <laughs> so at some point, those <laughs> gotta go away. Speak for yourself. But that's so weird. Yeah, well, like, it's losing some of the midline fins yeah. that are important for a fishy way of life. Because those are so character... Like, those are things that... Basically, every fish you can look at, <laughs> you can find those. Now, that's not to say... Now, obviously, there are lots of fish that have taken on specialized lifestyles that have changed the body plan. This is one of those. This is a specialization. One thing I want to point out is you've got Eusthenopteron, you've got Pandarichthus. There were a bunch of these. If you went back to this time period during the Devonian, you would see a diversity of kind of tetrapod-like fish. And this is the part where I want to make a point that we usually make when we talk about transitions. This wasn't a line of species leading directly into each other. This sort of status of fish that were a little bit stronger in the arms, a little bit weird head-shaped, was just how these fish were for a long time. So there's a diversity of kind of tetrapod-like fish, the most famous of which, by far the most famous ever since it was discovered 15 years ago, is the fishapod <laughs> Tiktaalik rosé. Tiktaalik comes from Ellesmere Island, Canada, late Devonian around 375 million years ago, so a little later than the two we've talked about already. Tiktaalik is famous because it is known from all about a dozen individuals, some of which are 3D preserved and very well preserved. That's so awesome. Like These are exceptionally well preserved skeletons. They range from one meter long to three meters long. So that's a good size, right? Ten feet long. Tiktaalik got big. The story of discovery in Tiktaalik is always a fun one to share. If you want to learn a lot more about this, look up Neil Shubin's book, Your Inner Fish. But Neil Shubin, Ted Deschler, and a group of researchers were trying, basically in the er around the turn of the century, aiming to find answers to the origins of tetrapods. And they knew from other early tetrapod discoveries what age to look for, and they knew from geologic surveys around the world what kind of rocks they would need from that age, right? Coastal, shallow marine type stuff. So they scanned maps and found rocks in Canada that were the right age, the right kind of environment. They dug for several years and then found Tiktaalik, which is one of the coolest examples of how we can use the fossil record to predict where we will find more fossils. Which is a key aspect of science is predictive ability. Predictions. And that's a cool prediction. <laughs> Tiktaalik has been referred to as the Archaeopteryx of tetrapods. It's sort of that classic, here is your in-between. It is considered a fish. 
depending on your definition of fish, because it has ray fins, right? It's, it's got those rays in its fins, and fish-like scales. Its front arms, even though, as we'll see, they have that lobe fin setup, they're still fins. They're still paddle-shaped. They're, this is definitely an animal that was swimming. However, it's got a bunch of other cool things. For one thing, its shoulder girdle is detached from its head, which makes Tiktaalik one of the first known animals, vertebrate animals, that could wear a tie. That could wear a tie. <laughs> With a neck. Yeah. You could strangle it. Yeah. <laughs> Things have necks now. That's that's cool. That, that that's a that's a major update. 375 million years ago, necks ne- necks were declared. <laughs> Tiktaalik also has a further shrunken hyomandibula, which suggests further changes to breathing and feeding. Its ribs are a little more tetrapod-like, a little more structural support to aid in perhaps locomotion, perhaps also in breathing styles that are important on land. And its fin bones, similar to what we saw in Pandorichthys, are more mobile. Indeed, because the fossils were preserved in three dimensions, the researchers were able to reconstruct the bones and see how they moved along next to each other. (laughs) <laughs> now you can hold the bones and go, eep, boop, beep, they can move this way. Which led them to determine that Tiktaalik had what looks to be something similar to a wrist joint. At the end of that humerus radius ulna is a little jointed area. An extra bend. An extra bend. So they suspect that Tiktaalik was able to support its front end on its front fins. Necks and push-ups. Push-ups! It is a fish that can do push-ups. They suspect that Tiktaalik was using this to, in quotes, walk along the bottom of a shallow ocean, you know, near the coast, probably was living in shallow waters. It would have had limited motion, but could push itself along with these front fins. This is something we see in fish. Lungfish do stuff like this. Some other fish are walking fish. A lot of your bottom-dwelling ambush fish have specialized fins to kind of hop along. Right, sort of scooching themselves along the bottom. However, Tiktaalik does not appear to have had enough motion in its front fins to swing them in a walking pattern. Like, if you look at a salamander or a lizard, mm-hmm. they have to swing the arm from back to front in order to properly walk. Tiktaalik probably wasn't doing that. It had enough fin power up front to push itself along, to push itself up if it needed to. It could kind of look around <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with its flat, almost croc-shaped skull. It was a fish that could do push-ups and waddle, kind of. Yeah, so, like, uh, probably... F- if you're trying to picture it, think less walking one foot in front of the other and more rowboating, like just eh, eh, yes, eh, just little sh- little consecutive push-ups in a direction. And this transition is also suspected to have gone hand in hand with development of lung breathing. So a lot of some fish today have what are called spiracles, which are on the skull near the eyes that can take in air. Over the course of the transition, in some cases, we see the spiracles enlarge in animals like this. So with Tiktaalik and its friends, we are seeing a group of fish adapting to have stronger muscular arms, moving themselves around in shallow oceans, lessening their dependence on aquatic style behavior and respiration, which means that after our short break, we can start, we can move on from tetrapod-like fish to discuss the very earliest fish-like tetrapods. Everybody, out of the pool. As we move through the late Devonian, in addition to this diversity of muscly fish, we also start to see creatures that can be called tetrapods. Around a dozen are known, mostly discovered since the 1990s, 
though some of the most famous ones are earlier, and we'll get to that. But here are a few of the, a few notable examples, starting with a creature called Elgonerpaton from around 375 million years ago, similar in age to Tiktaalik. This one's from Scotland. Now, Elgonerpaton, like most early tetrapods, is known from partial remains. In fact, a lot of early tetrapods are known from parts of the jaw and the front legs, which makes sense. Those are some of the diagnostic features of early tetrapods. It was large-ish, probably one to one and a half meters long, so we're, we're still we're several feet long. But what makes Elgonerpaton famous is that its limb girdles, right, the, the shoulder girdle and such, right, the shoulder girdle where the front arms attach, the front fins, are very tetrapod-like, very much a tetrapod, which means that Elgonerpaton has been designated the earliest known vertebrate with limbs. Okay, so now now they are not limb-like fins, they are limbs. Li at least f from what remains of the, the front limbs, they look to be true limbs. This is something you could be using to move around. Another example from around this time, around 365 million years ago in Latvia, Ventastega, another early tetrapod, also fragmentary, also has a very tetrapod limb girdle, in addition to limb changes, shows what was happening with the skull in early tetrapods. Compared to Tiktaalik and all of Tiktaalik's relatives, Ventastega has larger eyes, which again, good for seeing on land, a longer snout, and the back of the skull behind the eyes is shorter. So now we're, again, we're looking more like crocodile, salamander, lizard type face. Good, most likely good, for catching things on land. Another famous early tetrapod from Russia around the same age, Tulerpaton, is notable for having slender limbs. The limbs are, are well-preserved enough to know that it, they were a bit more slender, more long, like we see in tetrapods. And it had toes. Hey! Six toes on each hand, on each foot. Exciting. Which, that's a leg. You have a leg. However, these are all known from water. Tulerpaton is shallow marine. The others are shallow ocean deposits. These have limbs, but they're, they don't appear to be terrestrial. Now, there are a bunch of early ones that sort of hint at some of these changes, but the earliest well-known basal tetrapod, an early tetrapod, was actually discovered this year. Or at least it was named this year. And we talked about it in one of our newses. Yes, we did. Very recently. This was only an episode or two ago. This is a tetrapod named Parmastega. Parmastega! discovered in Russia around 372 million years ago, so almost as old as Tiktaalik, in coastal lagoon deposits, just over a meter long. It's vaguely crocodile-shaped. It's got a large eyes, and the eyes are on top of the head. So we're looking at an animal that could pop right up under the surface and stick its eyes out as though it's using its large eyes to look through the air. Yeah, it's getting uh, able to periscope up and get a view of things without revealing itself. Notably, Parmastega still has a lateral line system. You, they can see the canals in the lower jaw and such where the lateral line would work, which is which only works in water. Notably, it has it on the lower jaw, on the snout, the sides of the face, but not the top of the head. Because it doesn't work in air. So it very much looks like an animal that is popping the top of its head up out of the water. Notably, its nostrils are located on the underside of its snout. Oh, so it's still smelling through the water. It was not, and it wasn't breathing through the nostrils yeah. air. Um, it was probably using its spiracles to breathe in air instead of breathing through nostrils like we would do. Another interesting note about Parmastega is that its shoulder girdle is partially cartilaginous, so it's not fully bony. Some of it is, cartilage is basically pre-bone, and in this case it was cartilage that wasn't ever fully ossifying, which is a science word for bonifying. <laughs> so this is an animal that 
probably, again, wasn't actually leaving the water, but may have been hunting on the shoreline for things on land like those early arthropods. Nice, crunchy little snacks. A little fun note about Parmastega, because it was found with abundant other tetrapod remains, it there has been the suggestion that it may have been a schooling animal. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that neat? Oh, I like that. A bunch, just a school of crock-headed fish yeah. <laughs> swimming around the shore, popping their heads up. I'm picturing those those images when they are on um, eye spotting, you know, f- shining the flashlight across the surface of the water for crocodilian eye shine, and you come across just a horde of little shines twinkling where there's a bunch of babies that are all grouped together yeah. and just their eyes staring at you <laughs> waiting for bugs to crawl by and just yeah. snap them up but the most famous early tetrapods the most famous fish-like tetrapods are also the first two well-known ones that were discovered both from greenland names you may have heard acanthostega discovered way back in 1952 and Ichthyostega from 1932. Both from Greenland, both from the late Devonian around 365 to 360 million years ago. So right toward the end of the Devonian. Super famous not only for being among the first ever known, but for being known from some rather complete specimens. Skulls and indeed near full skeletons in some cases. That's pretty nice. These are pretty cool. So... Classically, they're envisioned as sort of these salamander-shaped creatures, which isn't totally an accurate comparison, but for the most part, you can imagine that they looked a lot like the other animals we're describing, with sort of flat heads, the eyes are a little bit dorsal, they've got these long mouths like a croc or a lizard or a salamander. Both Acanthostega and Ichthyostega have strong limbs and limb girdles, with what appears to be space for the attachment of large muscles and more differentiated muscles. So they're getting a variety of muscles. A variety of muscles. You know, if you look at your your pecs and your arms and such today, there's a ton of different muscle groups doing all sorts of stuff in there. You don't just have muscle A, B, and C. It's all of these, you know, these uh, interlocking and overlapping muscle fibers and bundles. So they're starting to get something a little more complex in there. Both have abundant toes. (laughs) Yes. Ichthyostega had seven, appears to be seven toes on each foot, and Acanthostega had eight. If anyone remembers our first spooky, this is why our fish person (sighs) had the extra toes. It's because, yeah, the first toed things had more because well because it's one of those things like well all tetrapods today the basic setup is five fingers or less if you've reduced it Mm -hmm. but why because that's what survived Mm -hmm. for whatever reason but in this period of experimentation it was toe central (laughs) well imagine how our counting would work (laughs) we'd count in base 17 14 16 sure (laughs) However, again, these are still aquatic. Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, both uh, the feet were are thought to have probably been webbed. Acanthostega, at least, is known to have had a fish-like tail fin, and its ribs were still a little fishy, still not quite as beefy. A little, and, little suspicious. And a little suspicious. Not quite what you'd expect from a tetrapod. Acanthostega also has a what appears to be a fairly inflexible wrist and ankle joints which suggests that its feet would have been very paddle like yeah that's exactly what that was sounding like is yeah. if you're not bending it much that's better for paddling or you know for flapping than it is for walking on it right so it has all the bones you'd expect it has toes it has all that but it's using them the way that you know like a dolphin might use it you're paddling along ichthyostega there have been uh, investigations of the inner ear structure in ichthyostega which is much more like what we see in aquatic animals than terrestrial animals ichthyostega appears to have been specialized for underwater hearing which again suggest these these were probably you know with with paddle feet acanthostega was probably wading more than it was walking 
Ichthyostega was clearly spending time with its head underwater. These are aquatic animals. Which brings up two very interesting points. One, like I said before, this isn't a straight line. No. These both are early tetrapods specialized for the water, just like we have tetrapods today specialized for the water. Absolutely. At this time in the late Devonian, we have achieved a tetrapod-like body. Strong arms, strong shoulders and hips, toes and fingers, but it's being used in a variety of ways. Well, and it's, there's nothing inherent about having a limb that says it needs to be on land. Right. Like, I feel like that's often a, a very easy misconception or leap in logic to make. And it's why we always harp on it's not a straight line. Yes. Because so often these transitions are shown as if there were fish and then this weird fish started doing this right. weird thing. And then Tony walked up on land. Yeah, and then left the water. No, there were fish some of which were doing something different than the rest, and some of which did that thing different a little bit more than the rest of the that group, et cetera, et cetera, until you eventually narrow down to the lineage that led to us. But there was a diversity of them, and all the rest didn't. Yeah. All the rest did not come on land. Otherwise, there would be multiple tetrapod lineages <laughs> That all left the water. These were doing just fine in the water with limbs. Which brings up the second really interesting point that the origin of tetrapods is not the same as the origin of terrestrial lifestyle. Absolutely. Tetrapod, like legged creatures, creatures able to move around with fairly advanced limbs, showed up before they left the water. And that shouldn't surprise us. Because no. legs underwater predate fish. Oh, yeah. Like, walking around under the water? Yeah, that's arthropods have been doing that for so long. And fish, walking fish, exist outside of just lungfish and tetrapods. So, yeah, there's a whole interesting time period here where it looks... We have limbs, but we haven't necessarily left the water yet. And this whole story is further complicated and made intriguing by trackways. <laughs> because it stands to reason that the first vertebrates to walk should be leaving the first vertebrate footprints. And indeed they are. There are a bunch of footprints thought to be vertebrate footprints from the late Devonian. They're known from all over the world. They're Australia, South America, uh, Europe, Greenland... A lot of them are disputed. Ichnology, right? You know, yeah. Trackways are infamously difficult to study. It's because they're they're not going to be consistent, and there's a lot that could leave something similar. There are a few tracks that some have pointed at that might be early vertebrates, but others have said that could also just be a large arthropod. But there are a few that are fairly well accepted. One example comes from Valentia Island in Ireland, which is a set of nine different trackways. Wow. Formed in what looks like a river in an area flooded by shallow water that some of the trackways look like paddling, but others look more like more terrestrial walking, more supported on those fins. And these go back to 385 million years ago. Whew. The other famous example I'll mention are the Z Zashelmi, Zakelmi, sorry, trackways in Poland, which are 395 million years old. Whew! Which is older than all of the animals I've mentioned so far. Yeah. This is another case, several tracks of varying sizes on a tidal plain, which a place that is sometimes covered in shallow water, ranging in size from small creatures to large creatures. There are notably no drag marks associated with them, which suggests either that this is something supporting its body off the ground. Yeah. Or it's in water. Yes. And you're walking, but you're not actually fully supporting your own weight. You're in the water and you're still suspended. There's, a, there's shallow enough water that you're still having to push up, but it's not so shallow that you're 
actually basically on the ground. Right. Some have suggested that this might be something tiktolic like which, if that's the case, it suggests that that group of animals that includes Tiktaalik and the sort of walking fish showed up much earlier than the fossil record would suggest. On the other hand, some people have pointed out that lungfish can leave tracks like that. So was this something that was actually moving around in a proper walking way, or was this more of um, pushing myself along the bottom of the water kind of thing? Regardless, these and a number of various trackway uh, uh, instances have been purported to indicate animals with weight-bearing legs. You are supporting your weight as you move around the bottom of a, of a flooded area. Which ain't nothing. Which is, again, very cool and might point to an even earlier development of these habits well before these animals actually properly left the water. And I'm sure for some people that probably raises the question, a valid question of, okay, but you know, why then? Why, if they were walking this well this early, why did it take so long to get out of the water? And there's lots of reasons for that. The one that I like that these examples point out is that they were both in watery habitats and yeah if you look at alligators and crocodiles for example alligators typically when they're on land mostly drag themselves or just kind of scoot like they just bear their legs are out to the side and they just kind of eh. they're not walking if they don't have to and then they can transition into what's known as the high walk the high walk they train they move the legs under the body and they walk walk they really only do that if they need to. I'm going to move a longer distance or something's in my way and I can't slide over right. it. If you're doing just fine in the shallows, yeah, there may be no pressure to move out. And then every now and then while you're you know, moving through this shallow river or this floodplain, there's suddenly something in the way or it just gets a little too shallow and you go, ugh, and ugh, you head yep. yourself up. Walk through it and then go back to being a fish. Right. You say, oh, thank goodness I can breathe air. And yeah. then you walk. You... Well, like mud skippers do this kind of thing today, that which are fish that mm -hmm. just hop between mud puddles. And so there's there's no reason that having these limbs wouldn't just be a handy thing to have. <laughs> it gives you a leg up. It gives you a leg up. <laughs> <laughs> it, that it wouldn't just be useful but not necessarily rewriting everything you have to do to survive. So the late Devonian is kind of, sort of, the time of the walking fish. Then the Devonian ends in a mass extinction that we discussed in episode 65, and it is in the next period, the Carboniferous, that we finally see terrestrial tetrapods. The early Carboniferous brings, you know, we're generally 360 to 340 million years ago, Fossils from this time period are exceedingly rare, but there are a couple that hint at the early tetrapods. There's one uh, animal called Pederpes, which belongs to a group called the Wachiriids. In Scotland, has tetrapod-like limbs, has five digits, <gasps> maybe more. Bye. The feet appear to have been forward-pointing, not sideways-pointing like we see in Acanthostega and others. So more aligned with the body, but still has some features of the ribs, the feet, the skull that are a bit more like ichthyostega, acanthostega, enough so that originally it was classified as a lobefin fish. But no, it appears to be truly tetrapod. And then also in Scotland, there is a extinct creature called Cassineria, which is, according to a paper I read, I will quote out of it, the first fully terrestrial tetrapod known in the fossil record. All right. Early Carboniferous, it has properly pentadactyl limbs, five fingers. It finally, we, we settled. Yes. Also, its hands are flexible and the toes end in claw-like structures. Wow. This was a walking creature. Claws already. Claws, well, something like claws. Yeah. Yeah. But still, that's just, wow. So it is in the early Carboniferous at the latest that we see these tetrapods finally make their way out of the water and onto land. Then in the later Cretaceous, 
tetrapods go nuts. <laughs> we see the origins of what we would consider true amphibians. Creatures that are still fish-like in the sense that they're probably laying eggs like fish, probably still tied to the water. Many would still probably have gills in their larval form. And these are amphibians. They're not living in deserts. I mean, you know, it's, salamanders still have that very paddle-like side-to-side fishtail. These include the temnospondyls, the lepospondyls, anthracosaurs, semoriomorphs, things that range from salamander-like to crocodile-like, proper, like, the first really croc-like creatures. Which, like, as we talked about, really they're all early tetrapod morphs. Yeah, it not... was it was one of the earliest things tetrapods did. <laughs> some of them are aquatic, some are semi-aquatic. Some, in their young forms, do still have uh, lateral line systems. That's cool. And gills. This includes famous things like Seymoria, a lot of things that were kind of bulky salamander looking creatures diplocolis which is the famous boomerang headed creature always been one of my personal favorites and then of course these set the stage in the carboniferous for the eventual rise of the lysamphibia which are the amphibians we know today true reptiles and then later on true mammals and synapsids and stuff episode 46 tetrapods have officially started So they went through this long period of lots of coastal shoreline, shallow water diversity. Testing the air. Testing the air. (laughs) Sticking a toe, right? Just (laughs) dipping a toe in the air. (laughs) Ah, (laughs) But there are some questions left open that people are still wondering, still trying to figure out. One of which is where the transition happened. For a long time, there was this old idea that I read referred to as Alfred Romer's drying pond hypothesis, which was that lobefin fish were driven onto land by a lack of water. This has been sort of replaced over time by the idea that the oceans became, for whatever reason, a difficult place for some of these fish, so they moved into fresh water, and that's where the transition happened. On land, but in, like on continents, but in the fresh water. However, as you'll notice in our discussion up till now, Many of these early tetrapods are found in lagoons or tidal regions or coastal regions. So nowadays, the evidence seems to be pointing that this transition happened in brackish water on the shores of the ocean, shallow ocean coastlines and such, which might also explain why they're everywhere. (laughs) Early tetrapods, it doesn't look like it was like this, right, Australia is where it happened or something. They are pretty quickly make it all around the world. Even the earliest ones are found very widely dispersed, which makes sense if they're living in coastal regions, they can still travel all around the continents. They're not isolated to one particular spit of land or anything. Yeah, the coast is continuous around the the lands that it, you find them. And if you can still live and thrive in ocean water, then yeah, you can pretty much go anywhere you want. Many of the transitional forms, like Tiktaalik and Pandarichthys, are found in the northern continents, Lower Russia. So it might be that that's where a lot of the transition was happening, but that remains to be seen. Another important question, why did it happen when it happened? Was there something special about the mid to late Devonian that drove this shift? Some factors that researchers have uh, sort of nodded to to explain this include uh, what I think is very obvious, the fact that there was stuff on land now. Yes, there's an, an ecosystem. There's plants, there's bug type things. There's a reason to go up there. There's food, right? That What what better impetus is there if, than uh, I'm going to go on land and grab that tasty thing? Food and, and shelter. There's stuff to hide among and, and find a home in. And there's nothing as big as you. Yes. So you uh, look, a, a fresh ecosystem to dominate. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> do, do, do. And most of that land diversity is near the water, right? Most plants and early land arthropods and such were still tied to coastal regions. So there's lots to enjoy 
up on the land. Yeah, with, with, uh, within fairly close reach. Within hopping distance. <laughs> Another thing that happens toward the late Devonian, as I mentioned before, is we get forests, which means we get true soils, which means that this is the first time in Earth history that you're getting a whole new influx of nutrients and decaying plant matter washing into the shallow oceans, which can mean a couple things. On the one hand, it means there's food. It means there's the shallow oceans are a nice place to be because you've got this nutrient influx. But it could also mean, so others have suggested, that when decaying stuff and nutrients go into the water, it becomes a very popular place for bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> nutrients cause algal blooms. <laughs> Woohoo! So another suggestion might be that with all this stuff washing off of the land, shallow oceans may have become depleted in oxygen because you have all these bacteria and stuff sucking up the oxygen, which may have provided a handy selective pressure for animals that could pop up out of the water and breathe in the air. Yes. (laughs) If the oxygen in the water is being depleted... It's super handy to be able to go elsewhere for your I, I was just about to say, go <laughs> go find a different source. And indeed, other people have pointed out that, yeah, it might be that the shallow oceans, either it's low oxygen or something else, were just a rough place to be. But then others have said, yeah, but these are all living in the shallow oceans, so what exactly might that pressure have been is unclear. Also, others have pointed out, as we've mentioned a couple of times, walking has evolved multiple times in fish. If you can, it costs less energy than swimming. It's just an easy, handy thing to be able to do. Handy, again. Nah. So it might just have been a bunch of fish were doing it. These happened to have been in the right place at the right time to move on to land. Or just stumbled upon the better adaptation for it that allowed them to go a step further. Aha. And also, walking opens up new opportunities for many fish like a lot of the walking fish today the ones that are underwater are just scooting underwater but then you get things like you know snakehead fish and you know walking catfish that can do weird stuff you know they're not walking the same way as these by any means but they're able to kind of wiggle wobble hop from one pool to another if this pool's not good anymore right so now you're not You can't be trapped as easily. Right. You have more options available to you. Another thing we don't have a lot of evidence for is the evolution of senses and feeding habits, which I will make a fun note on. I mentioned earlier, which I'd like to take just a moment to make a note about the importance of tongues. (laughs) Have you appreciated your tongue today? Fish don't have tongues. Not really. They have a like this bony structure in the mouth, but it's not an actual They have tongue. isopods. Yeah, they have <laughs> isopods in there. <laughs> but tetrapods, land animals, land vertebrates, almost across the board have muscular, mobile, fleshy tongues. Even if they're not able to go blah like us, there's still muscle there to yes. do stuff. Which is real important. If you've ever had like a pet lizard or something, when you feel... I, I, I used to live with a bearded dragon and you'd feed it and it sticks its tongue out and licks stuff up Mm -hmm. it'll blip and snap up little bugs and stuff tongues are super important for feeding when you can't suck water into your mouth a lot of fish feed through suction feeding Mm -hmm. they open their mouths all the, the mouth the bones around the mouth shift out of the way and it creates a pressure a low pressure that sucks in water and whatever's in front of them Get sucked in too. A great uh, way to kind of picture is if you've ever like dipped a cup into some water. Like next time you're in the bath, just dip a cup into the water and the water rushes into it. That's yes. the what they're creating. Is they're creating a, a vacuum, pulls the water in, and any little animals in that water go in with it. Water goes out the gills. Little tasty things get stuck. And like the with things like Goliath groupers, that if they get a good suck. On their prey, it doesn't just go in the mouth, it is then in the stomach. Oh yeah, no, it goes straight <laughs> down the throat into <laughs> you, the stomach. <laughs> I, You go from out of my mouth to swallowed. But that only works on in water. Yeah. In land, you can't do that. Because then it goes in your lungs. <laughs> well, well, really, you can't do it because the air is not dense enough for that to work. We don't know how they went from suction feeding to tongues, but 
I read a paper recently because I wrote a SciShow episode about this. So for more information, go to SciShow on YouTube and look up SciShow Tongues. But in brief, a bunch of researchers looked at mudskippers, which are land-hopping fish, and studied how they feed and found that what they'll do is carry a mouthful of water with them, walk over to the tasty thing, blur the water onto it, and then suck the water up and take the tasty thing in with them. And what they found is when they do that, the bones of the mouth move in a similar way as the bones in the mouth of something like a lizard or salamander when they stick their tongue out to lap something up. That's really cool. So something like that may have provided the step between proper suction feeding and having a tongue that can help you feed. I like that it's the, the on-land of equivalent of when the um how the star nose mole smells underwater by puffing out air and then inhaling yes. it again to <laughs> s- I, if if i can't work in this environment i'm gonna take some of my yeah. environment with me i'm bringing it with me <laughs> another thing that has gotten a lot of attention is the details of the development of limbs and digits exactly when did they evolve exactly what were the steps a lot of genetic work has gone into this Because what we're finding, as one paper described it, the more fossils you get, the harder it becomes to define what a digit is (laughs) or what a limb is. And since limbs are an important defining feature of tetrapods, it becomes harder to identify what a tetrapod is. Because as we've discussed before, we decide when the names fit. So there's always a little bit of you have to be kind of arbitrary. Yeah, at some point you have to place a line. Right. But there wasn't ever a line. It's a it's gradients. Gradients all over the place. So as is often the case, the more we learn, the harder it becomes to really identify where this starts and this ends. And we're finding these odd disconnects of what we expected. Like I said before, that tetrapods seem to have originated truly in the water well before they went on to land. So I will leave you with a sentence that I'm paraphrasing out of a paper that I read. We're starting to get the sense that the origin of limbs, the origin of terrestriality, and the origin of tetrapods might be three different things. That's really awesome. And it makes sense. Once again, getting limbs at no point inherently means you need to come on land. Yeah. All three of those things have benefits by themselves. The, the the mud skippers are terrestrial fish. They spend as much time on land as in water, and really the times they're in water are when they're in burrows they've made on land. And they don't have any of those things. <laughs> well, it's like we discussed in episode 37 with birds. The origin of wings and the origin of birds and the origin of flying not quite the same thing. As we discussed in a recent news article with snakes, the loss of limbs is not the same thing as the origin of snakes. Yes. We we get, like I said way at the beginning, it's very easy to get in your head. We started here. We ended here. All those changes must be related to each other. It must, you, you know, the classic strictly Darwinian sort of gradual change leads to this assumption that everything changed from point A to point B at the same time in the same way. But that's not true. And this is a wonderful example, not just of how different parts of the body changed in different ways at different stages, but that different aspects of the behavior did too. Mm -hmm. I feel that it's so easy once we have the full picture. We don't we don't have the full picture. But we're working on it. When we are able to look back as we are as paleontologists and people on these past events, it's hard for the way our brains work not to view them the way we would a a, a novel or movie. Right. It's, we want it to be well written. We exactly. We're we <laughs> well we already know the story. It's not a story like that. Right. But we it, know well we know the end. Exactly. <laughs> we, we know, know <laughs> we know the beginning, we know the end. The asteroid did it. So in our mind, the plot is what happens in between. Right. And that's <laughs> it's hard not to frame all the events. Getting limbs, breathing air, 
coming on land, not to frame those as plot points, but they're not. No. These were things that were happening just like anything happens in evolution. Something was selecting for that thing, but it often doesn't have anything to do with what comes later. From the middle Devonian to the early to middle Carboniferous, we see this incredible diversity of very, very strange fish developing stronger limbs, making their way into the shallows and on land, developing new styles of feeding and breathing that ultimately result in the emergence of true tetrapods. And as we continue to study the fossil record, we continue to find more of them to get a complete picture. I hope that our listeners have gotten a greater appreciation for this picture over this episode. I sure have. This yes. was super fun to talk about. No, I, I love this topic because I think it's so it's so interesting, but also important to look at the, the transition as not vertebrates finally make it to land. Right. And fish do weird and cool stuff. And some of them leave the water. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some, some of them became Temnus bondles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so that's really what it was. And man, are they weird and cool. So, my fellow Sarcopterygians, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this dive into the earliest days of our own lineage. I hope you've had a great time, not only with this episode, but all of our 2019 slate of episodes. Like I said... Check out the Q&A, end of the year Q&A, which will be coming up uh, right at the end of the year. As always, check out the blog post for pictures and links, more information for you to explore, links to the news articles. We release new episodes every fortnight, a trend that will continue into 2020. I hope you've all had a good year. Yes. I hope that your next year is better. Let us know, as always, what you'd like to hear more of. Let us know if you have a favorite thing we did in 2019. Yeah, we'd love to hear if there's a favorite thing from this year almost past. And is there anything you you are looking forward to in the year to come? What do you want to see in 2020? Generally, but specifically from us. <laughs> Here's to another three years. <laughs> what do you want to see happen in that future? Let us know. And until then, enjoy the new year. Enjoy the new decade. Walk tall. Hey oh. <laughs> I got nothing. I'm trying to make a joke. I'm trying to seem hip. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Goodbye, 2019. <laughs> Goodbye, listeners. We'll see you next year. Here's the 2020. <laughs> Sign off phrase. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.